Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome all of you to the Mock Trial Coaches Conference for this year. Um, I'm one of the co-chairs of the Mock Trial Subcommittee. My name is Ellen Hennick, and my other co-chair, Marta Meyer, is sitting right in the middle there. Part of the purpose of this conference is to get coaches a chance to get together, to talk about some of the things with Mock Trial, to we try and highlight different things, different years. This year we have three different presentations for you. One on dealing with attorney coaches and that role. One is talking about how to teach hearsay. And then the last presentation has to do with organizing scrimmages, which is done by one of the people who, for those of you who have been coaches for a while, the second the list gets active, there's usually Missy up there organizing scrimmages. So we figured we'd go to the source of the person who seems to do an awful lot of that. All right, our first speaker this afternoon is Nathan Bear. Nathan is an attorney coach. He coaches in Shorewood and has coached many successful teams, including the team that won state last year. Pardon? Oh, that, I'm sorry, came in second. They were so excited about, go, about being in the finals that you kind of forget what happened after that. His team, it, it, you know, when you haven't been in the finals really, the te his team was so excited about being in the finals, they might as well have won the thing for that much excitement. I wasn't sure Nathan was going to survive it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> in any event, uh, Nathan has been coaching for many years, and we asked him to come here today to talk about dealing with attorney coaches, working with attorney coaches, things that teacher coaches can do to make it easier for attorney coaches, things that attorney coaches need to be aware of in dealing with students because it really is, and I've been an attorney coach, it really is a little bit different than simply being an attorney. So with that, with that I'm going to turn it over to Nathan. Thank you, Ellen. Um, for some of you who may not know me, just to uh, give you a little bit of my background and how I got involved in mock trial, um, back many years ago when I was in high school, uh, I went to uh, Appleton East up in the Fox Valley and participated in mock trial. And it had a big impact on me. Um, the attorney coaches that we had were really spent a lot of time with us. They took us to their law firm. Um, they showed us around. They showed us what it was like to be a lawyer. And uh, we actually took a field trip to Madison, and they, we, we met some other lawyers, and we got to see some arguments in front of the Supreme Court. And so when I was a, a third-year law student, um, anybody who's been to law school knows that, you know, they say the first year they work you to death, the second year they, um, they scare, the first year they scare you to death, the second year they work you to death, and the third year they bore you to death. And so I had some extra time on my hands. I was living in Shorewood, and I called, and I said, do you have a team? Would you need any help? And there was a coach there that had done it for years and years. He was a great coach. And um, I thought, you know, I'd show up now and again and help out here and there and maybe judge a few practice rounds. Well, um, that's pretty much what I did. And then the next year, um, the, the, the gentleman who had been coaching had taken a new job and couldn't do it anymore. And I received this phone call. And they said, do you want to coach the team? And so the, the rest is history. Um, I said yes. And uh, so I've been doing it for, I think this will be my 12th year. Um, I, I really think that um, what's most important about the program is giving kids a chance to build some self-esteem and giving them an opportunity to succeed in an area where maybe they've, they're a little bit hesitant when they start, something that um, uh, maybe they didn't know they could do. And, and I, I think that's really the value of the program. When you look, uh, we all have you know, the type A personality kids who are in everything. And, um, you know, and, and they're in 85 different extracurricular activities, and that's great. And those kids are, you just plug and play. You plug them in there, and they can do it. But to me, I think the thing that I'm most proud of that I think this program has reached is maybe some of the kids who didn't know that they could do this, didn't know that they could stand up in front of a group of people and, uh, and, and make an argument, didn't know that they could play the role of a witness, and stand in front of a, um, a judge and do that. And uh, I had probably the most satisfying thing um, about this. I've, I've had parents come up to me after. I just um, had a, 
a student that graduated last year, I ran into a, a, one of the parents at, a, um, at the grocery store, and she said, you know, my daughter, um, she was very quiet and reserved when she started this, and by the time she graduated, she had so much more confidence, and she just had to give a, give a speech in her first year English class in, in college, and she said, Mom, you know, what's the big deal? I stood up in front of the state Supreme Court and talked. You know, this is nothing, you know. So to me, that's, that's really what the program is all about. Um, I, I guess when I was preparing my remarks for today, I took a look at the, um, the, the topic here, guidelines and tips for attorney coaches, and I had sort of prepared some things on that topic, but then I realized I had emailed this week, and I said, well, how many attorney coaches do we have? And so, well, it's mostly teacher coaches, and the, return, the attorney coaches that we do have, um, have are sort of veterans who have done this before. So I don't want to cater my presentation to one or two people in the audience. So um, we talked about it, and I, what I thought I'd do is talk a little bit about how you can work with your attorney coaches to maybe get the most out of them to help you be your best. And the other thing is um, I've, I've kind of go off, gone off in a little bit direction. I thought that I would talk a little bit about just general tips or general things about trial advocacy as an attorney um, that, um, and share some, some of my observations about mock trial over the years with you so that you in turn can, can help your students do their best. So, um, the, and the last, before I, before I get into that, I did notice um, teaching hearsay is the next session and that's um, gonna be taught by Professor Dan Blinka and uh, for, for a lawyer, anybody that is from Wisconsin or has gone to Marquette, it's sort of like opening for the Rolling Stones. You know, Blinka is, if you look under the statutes in uh, the Wisconsin evidence, you'll see it says, see Blinka on evidence after every single evidentiary rule. And literally, you know, his book is the horn book. He, he is literally the expert. So um, if there's one thing that you see today that's going to be of value to you, and I will be sitting here watching with you. Um, that's he's the rock star today. He's he's the guy that you want to hear, and because hearsay is one of the rules that's um, even practicing judges or practicing lawyers and practicing judges still don't know what that is uh, many times. So, at any rate, um, to talk a little bit about um, uh, the role of the the attorney coach and, and how you can best utilize it, I, I guess. Are there, is there anybody that is, is having trouble locating, you know, our team's having trouble finding an attorney coach to work with us? Has anybody had that issue? Okay, I guess not. Um, I had planned on talking a little bit about, you know, contact your local bar association and things like that, but it sounds like nobody has. Maybe somebody watching on, on, online does. Um, so I'll address that briefly. Again, there's, there's, there's local bar associations. There's a Milwaukee Bar Association, the Waukesha Bar Association, the Dane County Bar Association. Call them up and say, hey, you know, we've got this program. We want um, somebody to come in and help our team. Are there any names that you might have? And I guarantee you that they'll be willing to try and help you and, put, um, and, and send an email around and, and see if they can find a match. Um, ideally, it's somebody who might live in your own community um, that's not always possible, especially in some remote or more rural areas where, the, you know, the, the number of lawyers isn't as many. I mean, I always say that, you know, anybody could do what I do in Shorewood because you can't throw a rock in Shorewood without hitting a lawyer. Um, now, in some of the more rural areas, I know, uh, like, Rhinelander's lucky to have somebody like Jim Jacoby who's been doing it for how many years? 20? 22. 22 years. Um, you know, and then in some of the smaller towns, probably heard the old joke about the one attorney opened, uh, hung up a shingle in town and he had absolutely no work. He was struggling to get by. He was barely eating. And then another uh, attorney hung up a shingle across the street and he had more work than he could possibly know what to do with. So in some of the rural areas, it's harder. But I would say contact your local, um, you know, your local bar association. In terms of what to look for, um, for example, last year's case dealt with an elder law issue. And you might think, well, you know, if a, if a case is a criminal case or if a case is, you know, is an elder law case or there's a, there's, or I'm sorry, two years ago it was the elder law. Last year it was a real estate. You might think, let's, um, was it, was last year the real estate case? Yeah. Okay, all right, all right, last year. Possession. Adverse possession, right. Right, so you might think that, well, I need to go find a lawyer that 
deals with adverse possession or, you know, uh, I need, I need an, an elder law lawyer. That's actually not necessarily the case because um, in, in a lot of particular fields, you don't see the inside of a courtroom a whole lot. What you're probably looking for is somebody who tries a lot of cases. And that's becoming rarer and rarer and rarer to find. Um, uh, there's, you know, the partners at my firm, you know, if uh, they tell stories about, you know, back in my day, we try, we try 12 cases a year, you know, one a month. And, you know, I mean, I'm lucky if I have four in a year. So um, things change and, you know, there's not as many people. Where do you find those people? Um, the district attorney's office is a good place to find them. The U.S. attorney's office is a good place to find them. And uh, um, plaintiff's firms that, that file a lot of cases, um, in insurance litigation, defense firms that try a lot of cases. Um, what you really want is somebody who has experience that's, been, that's actually stood in front of a jury of 12 people and tried to convince them of, uh, of, their, you know, of their point of view. And you know, I always say that you know, for lawyers at the end of the day, whether you stand up and um, you're the greatest orator you know, of all time or whether you can barely get two sentences out during the time that you uh, give a cross-examination, essentially at the end of the day for, for a practicing lawyer, it really doesn't matter as long as uh, on that special verdict form at the end of the day they either find for you or, or, or not. So um, you want to find, when you're looking for a lawyer, um, like I said, you know, you want to find somebody that's had that experience, uh, plaintiff's firms, insurance defense firms, DA's office, um, things like that. Now, it, when you do find somebody that, that is, um, uh, says, you know, okay, I want to become involved, um, you know, I think you want to find out, have you ever dealt with, you know, have you ever dealt with high school kids before in this capacity? Because it's almost essentially like a teaching role. And, um, you know, you kind of want to do a little screening process and make sure it's going to be an appropriate fit for where you are and, uh, um, and you know, and that they understand what the time commitment's going to be. Um, I know that there, the teams in Wisconsin, I've talked to many of the coaches um, all, all over the state, and it seems like participation of attorney coaches runs the gamut from somebody who shows up twice a month and gives a talk about the rules of evidence or shows up and, and, and may, you know, judge a practice round. And if that's all you can find and if that's all the time commitment that, that you can get from somebody, you know, that's okay, but it, it's better than nothing. But I, but, I do, I, but I do think if you can get them exposed to the program, if you can show them how it makes a difference with kids and um, the, the good that we can do by building self-esteem and helping kids, that I think that you know, you can, get, you can get their participation, you can get them to participate more and more um, as the year progresses. On the other extreme, I know that there are teams where the attorney coaches essentially run the team and uh, a couple of years to keep it going, we really didn't have a teacher advisor. This is about five, six years ago. I saw the teacher advisor, I met him, I shook his hand at the beginning of the season and then he showed up at regionals because we had to have a, a chaperone from the school there and that's pretty much all I ever saw him. So I know that it sort of runs the gamut and it sort of runs the extreme um, uh, between those two. Uh, what, what, what I really thought might be valuable, and it's about 1.30 now, um, is, is bef and before I start my um, actual PowerPoint presentation and talk a little bit about trial advocacy, um, are, are there any questions about you know, recruiting, finding attorney coaches, um, how you work with them, um, any, anything like that? And no? Okay. What I, what I want to do then is shift gears a little bit. And I always say, whatever you do, get out from behind the podium and don't hide behind it. And I'm about to do just that because I'm a little bit limited by where the microphones are. And I have my PowerPoint presentation here. So. One thing that I think the attorney coaches can do is try and give students, uh, I think, a, a realistic idea of how our, how our advocacy system works, what it means to be an advocate, and, 
and, and, exa and how you do that. Um, one of the things that our team has done um, over the years is, uh, and, and I, our, our uh, teacher coach is taking a group this year to the, to the uh, state Supreme Court, and they're actually going to watch an oral argument, and they're going to take a tour of the Capitol. I think that kind of thing, to get beyond the four walls of the school and um, to get sort of that real world experience, maybe you take a trip down to the circuit court, maybe you go tour the federal court. Um, I think taking those types of trips and seeing how what they're doing in the, in the mock trial, uh, you know, how society and how our courts are actually dealing with real disputes in the real world. Um, another thing that, uh, that you can ask your attorney coach, and, and they can help you with that, another thing that they can help you with is if you do have a case in a particular area like we did last year with adverse possession or the year before with another law issue, um, use your attorney coach as a resource and they may know somebody who specializes in that particular field that can come in and talk one day about, you know, what does all this mean in the bigger picture? You know, even though they give us a limited amount of materials and they only want us to focus on one law, you know, why do we even have that law? You know, how does it play into, you know, fairness? You know, how, how, do, how do these rules play into the bigger picture of the law? I think that's important as well. Um, the other thing we, we've done in the past that, that, that I think your attorney coaches can help make connections to the rest of the community is one year we had an issue of um, poisoning, uh, like a poisoning of a well. And we brought in somebody from the DNR um, just to talk about, you know, yeah, there's cases like this. There's a case out in Waukesha right now where there was contamination of gas into a bunch of wells out in that area. And that, that's an ongoing issue right now. So you, you can play on things in the real world and, and that are popular in the news, and I think it's good to talk about those because, it, again, it takes you past the four walls of the school and it takes you past the boundaries of what we do in mock trial, and I think those can be um, extremely valuable. One, the, the one year that, um, that we were fortunate enough to, to advance to the, to the national tournament, they actually had a case where there was a ship that blew up in the harbor, and one of the experts in that case was the harbor master. And on a whim, we picked up the phone and we called the harbor master in Milwaukee. And the guy was just shocked that there was a group of high school kids that wanted to come and see what he did. He said in the 40 years or whatever he had been harbor master, nobody ever even, he'd go to parties and nobody would even, what do you do? I'm a harbor master. Who cares? You know, he'd, no one had ever shown interest or even asked about what he did. He was so excited to show these kids around that he gave everybody hats that said Milwaukee Harbor on it. And and uh, gave them this great tour and talked to them. And so those, those types of things. And when I see those kids um, now, you know, and that was probably six years ago, um, but when I see them around town, they'll, they still talk about going on that tour. So I think to, to, to help have your attorney coach help you to reach beyond, again, the four walls of the school and what you're doing to see how the law fits into the, the bigger uh, society, I think is really important. Um, I wanted to give you some, my, some of my perspective on, on, um, on, on how to share certain uh, trial skills or, or advocacy concepts with high school kids. Um, now, in this particular case this year, this is not, working backwards doesn't necessarily apply um, quite, as, quite as well as it did last year. But you, you may remember last year, we had this big, long, uh, verdict form, right? And it said, you know, did so-and-so do X? Did so-and-so do Y? Did so-and-so do Z? And then did so-and-so adversely possess? I think there was five or six questions on this special verdict form. If you really want to know what your goal has to be in the trial, look at that verdict form and say, I either want people to answer the questions on the verdict form yes, or I want them to answer the questions on the verdict form no. That will direct what comes out in the testimony of the witnesses. Because what I see a lot of times is um, kids go up and there'll be questions that'll be question number one mirrors paragraph one of the affidavit, question two mirrors paragraph two of the affidavit, question three mirrors all the way down till you get to the bottom and that's it. And, and a lot of times people think, well, because it's in the affidavits, I, I, I'm supposed to testify about it. You may not care what is in half of the affidavit. In fact, we've had years where our directs were probably less than three minutes because all we needed from that one witness was for them to hammer on one thing 
that fit into our case theme, and we didn't even go into anything else. And then what happens is a kid will get up with a canned cross-examination, and they won't have paid any attention to what was said on direct, and they'll start asking cross-examination questions that are diffusing, that were intended to diffuse something that the witness didn't even testify into direct anyway. So I think working backwards, now this year, it doesn't work quite as well because you got two verdict forms, right? You either write guilty or you write not guilty. But, but in general, I think working backwards to say what is the end result that you want to achieve is a really good way to get them thinking about where they want to go. Um, this is another thing I think that attorney coaches, um, that, that you, can, you can work with the attorney coaches on, tell the students that the presiding and the performance judges have not read the materials. Um, that um, if, if they go in assuming that, they're going to be way, way, way better off. What, what they sort of lose in, in the bigger picture is that they deal with this case on a two, three times a week for literally months by the time it gets to competition. And, you know, and I always tell them, you know, assume that your judge and your jury, by definition, know absolutely nothing about the case. You know, they don't know the names of the witnesses. They don't know um, who the defendant is. They don't know who, who was shot. They don't, they don't know any of the details about the case. And if you don't get that out there in the first 15 seconds, if they don't know who you are, who you represent, and what you're going to ask them to do at the end of the trial, they're probably already wandering off. In the age of Twitter and Facebook and, and, and people that watch CSI on television and all that other stuff, they barely give you any time before they start to drift off mentally. Um, this is my rule number one. Um, when I work with when I work with students, and it is quite simply don't be boring. And what I mean by that is, unfortunately, I have a little video, but I don't. It, I think the connection doesn't work here. But exactly what I'm doing right now is a bad example. I shouldn't be behind the po podium using it as a security blanket, but really I'm only doing that because I'm sort of tethered to my microphones. Um, moving around, you know, you want them to be comfortable enough to move around a little bit. You want them to use transitions. You want them to vary their speed. You want them to vary their pitch when they're talking to the judge and when, you, when they're talking to the jury. As attorneys and attorney coaches, you can, you know, th this is the type of thing that we can instill uh, with students. Um, my rule number two is the grandma rule. I've sort of alluded to this already. If you cannot explain the case to your grandmother in three minutes or less, you need to go back to the drawing board because you don't know your case, period, end of story. I don't care how complex it is. I don't care if it's the litigation. Uh, I don't care if it's the Microsoft litigation, okay? You, you, you literally need a, to encapsulate that in three minutes or less, and then you say to them, yes, okay, it's com more complicated than that, but the bottom line is X. And, and um, I, I was doing this exercise with, um, an exercise relating to this the other night at, at, at our first practice, and, and I said um, to the team, all right, you're, if you're the prosecution, what's the number one, what's the first thing you're gonna tell me about this case as to why he's guilty? And I heard, you know, well, there's a witness that places him at the scene, this and that. I went through about 10 kids, and, and nobody said, because he confessed. And th what, what they do when they read the materials is, they think, well, okay, the, the, the affidavits by definition are equal on, they're, they're supposed to be set up so they're equal on both sides. So they, they're afraid to oversell or, or advocate for a particular position because, well, you know, maybe he didn't really confess because he wouldn't sign it later. Hey, if you're the prosecution and you're advocating the fact that this guy is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, he confessed, okay? So um, the grandma rule, and it, it probably ought to be two minutes it used to be five minutes, I put it down to four minutes, now I put it down to three minutes, and I tried to hold, hold myself to this when I actually try cases myself as well. Um, but, but I absolutely, when you say the grandma rule, it, it, the, the kids understand what you're talking about and they know what you mean. When you say don't be boring, it becomes a catchphrase, it becomes a catchphrase that has more meaning beyond you know, just don't be boring. When you say that, they know what you're talking about. In this one, this is, probably what I found to be 
the absolute, without a doubt, hardest thing to teach to high school kids, and frankly, the hardest thing to teach to actual practicing lawyers. Um, I've tried cases. I, I've seen where I've seen you know counsel get up, and it's good morning, Your Honor. May it please the court, members of the jury. I mean that that is the jury is gone already. Um, the you have to talk to the jury. And when I say talk to them, I'm not talking about giving them a speech. And you know, the, the Gettysburg Address might be a fine piece of oratory, but it'd be awful as an opening statement. And that's usually the example I give because they've, usually, they've just studied that in their history class or something. Um, you have to literally look at them and ask, and, and ask them to do something like we're having a conversation. Um, and sure, they're sitting over there and you're, you're over here behind the podium or behind the table. But you need to connect. You need to look them in the eye and explain it to them. I always tell kids, hey, look, you know, pretend like you're arguing with your parents for a later curfew. You know, your, your curfew is 8 o'clock and you want it to be 11 o'clock, right? Go. They don't have any problem with that. They can give me 15 different reasons, passionate reasons, why they're old enough and responsible enough to have a curfew at 11 or 12 o'clock at night. Um, and, and, and you can, you know, you can talk about the local ordinance that, um, says that you know they can't be on the street after X, and there'll be great debate over that. But you you know you you ask them to to argue that the defendant in this case is is um, is guilty, and they go into Dan Rather mode. You know so um, that this talk to the jury is probably one of the hardest things for any practicing lawyer to do, but also obviously for the high school kids, and and that's something that um, you know. I, that we struggle with every year, and we try to get them get them there by the end of the season. But um, was there a question? Or did I see a hand or something? I thought I might have saw a hand. No. Okay. If anybody wants to jump in here too, um, I I talked to him a little bit about attention spans as well. Um, I did. The interesting thing is, you always you kind of hear that it's like 18 to 20 minutes, or it's 15 to 20 minutes, or 12 to you know whatever it might be. You sort of hear that shorthand. If you put in, if you put in this search on Yahoo, short attention span length or adult attention span length, all these things kind of come up, but it's, I, I couldn't really trace it back to um, any one like definitive study where, you know, uh, it's become the conventional wisdom. But frankly, I think it's actually way, way too long. And when you only have 45 minutes to put your, is it 40 or 45? I always screw that up. It's, it's, it's 40, right? 40 minutes to put your entire case in, you don't have that long anyway. Um, you, you've really got, you know, if, if you've got three minutes, uh, three to four minutes to give an opening statement or a closing argument, um, you know, uh, that's, uh, that's pretty much all the time you've got. Um, trial themes. Uh, let me uh, throw this up out for discussion a little bit because uh, I've been talking too long here. Uh, to me, this is always one of the more fun uh, type or the fun things about coaching is trying to brainstorm and get them into thinking about what their case theme is going to be. Um, what is, you know, what does the case lend itself to? In this case, it's a criminal matter. Um, last, you know, last year it was a, you know, there, there was an adverse possession issue. So, I, you know, how did, is there, is there anybody have any good stories about, you know, how some kid on their team came up with a brilliant, uh, or how they worked through developing a theme, or does anybody have any thoughts or, or, or comments on, on theme development with high school kids? I'm trying to, Ms. Schwinn. My word about that, my word about that is don't be afraid of that. I mean, at some point, what? D don't be afraid of the theme changing over the course of the season. 
um, at some point you got to kind of shut down the uh, shut it down and focus and get ready for regional sure but you know you can have one theme in October another in November another in December and you know because as they learn and explore and think about the case more and more they have all kinds of great thoughts about it and I think the worst thing you can do is just you know shoot them down right off the bat at some point everybody has to like hunker down and concentrate but you know let them free range around a little bit they they seem to have more fun that way yeah and you know it's it's funny because when when you were talking about that um i just i just finished up this big brief that i was filing in the federal court and it made me think about what what i write last is the introduction because you get your arguments in there you get them out the way you want them and then then you write your introduction which is here's why you know here's here's the synopsis of my argument and here's why I should win, you know. And so sometimes that comes later. And, and I think kids have this idea that it has to be sort of this big complex thing. And sometimes it can be as sim just simple as one particular fact. You know, um, how, whatever you might think about the defendant, you know, he confessed. Whatever you think about all this other stuff, whether you think it was a yellow jacket, a green jacket, or a striped jacket, or a kid with curly hair, or a kid with straight hair, or a kid nine feet tall or three feet tall, he confessed. You know, and sometimes just that, that, that enough can be something to build on, and it doesn't have to be, um, in fact, I think my next slide, let me just see here. And by the way, I just put a few of these in here. If you look on the internet, there are all kinds of websites that are more than happy to help you uh, with case themes. Um, I just, for fun, I put in a search. And um, um, here's just a couple of them that I found. But these tired themes to avoid, and you don't have to raise your hand, but I, I'm pretty sure that every single person in this room has heard these. Let's paint a picture. Who cares? Okay. Let's put a puzzle together. Each piece of evidence is a puzzle. I can tell you that the, everybody that's done, that's doing the judging, has heard that about four bazillion times, and it's 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 not really like putting a piece of it's not it's not putting a puzzle together. It's just this is a story about. Well, okay, you may be telling the story, but just not terribly effective. Um, a roadmap. That's another one I've heard. Any of these, I only I only put them on the list if I've heard them at least two dozen times. Um, any other ones that I missed that, I, yeah. This isn't a theme that you've missed, and I haven't done it, tried it in mock trial context, but I teach a brief writing class, and one of the things I've done with theme that's worked very, very well is to ask them to tweet it. What would they tweet? Because it restricts them to 144 characters. Oh, I like that. Uh, so that's, I, I don't tweet, so I don't know thought about it. Is it well, how, how many is 140? 140. Okay. So 140 words or less, I like that. Um, the other one, and this I think is, um, everybody's guilty of this a little bit, and I, every year I just try to make them not do this. Um, we will have three witnesses. The first witness will say X, the next witness will say Y, and the third witness will say Z. Okay, that, who cares? You know, again, I tell your story and weave in you know, okay, there's, we're at the scene of the crime. There's a gentleman across the street or a lady across the street with her son or daughter sitting on a porch. Boom, you know, X, you know at, at 5.30, this happens. Shots ring out. You know, then somebody's running, and this happens, and this happens. And another witness will confirm what the person on the porch saw. And, and you weave it together, and, 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 and if, you, if you just do it, we'll have three witnesses, and one's going to say this, and another one's going to say that. You know, again, I think at that point, um, the, uh, the the performance judges are looking down at their sheet, you know, and maybe they've got their smartphone there and they're doing something else. I mean, uh, if you want to tune them out, these these themes or tired themes to avoid, I think, are, are ones that um, generally will will do that rather quickly. Um, I'm running out of time. I actually had an example from a case that I tried a couple of years ago, but I'm going to skip over that. Um, okay, if there's nothing else that you remember from today, 
This is probably the most important thing that I try to work with high school kids on relating to evidence. And I call it for, it, I struggled with how to encapsulate this for, for many years and I wasn't very good at it. And I think I'm finally getting a little bit better at explaining it to them. I call it stopping the conveyor belt. And what I mean by that is generally when these trials happen, you watch them and okay, you know, here's a piece of evidence going by just like you're at, you know, the grocery store, it goes by in the conveyor belt. You know, the witness said that there was a kid running with a green, you know, green and yellow jacket. Okay, that goes by. Um, somebody was sitting on the porch and heard shots. Okay, that goes by. You know, um, uh, the police officers related to the, you know, the, the other witness, so there might be bias. That goes by. The kid confessed. That goes by. And well, Everything goes by at the same speed and everything goes by, there's no differentiation over what's important versus what's merely a detail that helps you um, see the bigger picture. And when you've got the number one piece, when you've got your absolute most important piece of evidence, you gotta stop the conveyor belt, you gotta hold the piece of evidence up in front of the jury and shake it around in front of their face, turn it over four different sides and say, this is my most important piece of evidence. I want you to look at it. If you don't do that, the jury will simply watch the conveyor belt go by and they'll say, ah, maybe that piece of evidence is important. Ah, maybe that one's important. I'm going to pick up this one. I like that piece of evidence. It's your job to help these kids understand as lawyers that they that's their job. They they have to stop the conveyor belt, hold that piece of evidence up. A couple of years ago was the, the case where um, it was the family law dispute, and there was a fatal flaw in the case, and the fatal flaw in the case was that um, as long as the person who set up uh, the power of attorney, mom, in our case it was mom, it could have been dad, um, as long as mom said, um, uh, this is the person that I want to designate, and there's nothing mentally wrong with me, then every single other argument on the face of the planet doesn't matter. Even if money is falling through the trustee's hands like water, it doesn't make any difference. And one side of the case had an expert that said mom was competent, and the other side of the case had none. The case was never would have survived motions. Okay, so the fatal flaw was um, we, we got the only doc in the case, and mom's competent. That's, that was the one piece of evidence that you had to shove in front of the jury's face and say, do you see this? This is important, and turn it over. And the way you turn it over is you ask similar questions about the same piece of evidence, and you stop and you pause. Well, okay, you know, um, um, ma'am, you know, did, or, or, or you, the doctor, you know, did you examine, you know, Miss so-and-so? Yeah. And did you evaluate whether or not she was competent? Yep. And, and how do you do that? Well, okay, I give her all these tests. And after you gave her all these tests, did you determine that she was competent or incompetent? You determined that she, I determined she was competent. And after you determined she was competent, did you ask her who she wanted to be, you know, the, to uh, conduct her affairs and, and be the administrator of her state and all this stuff? Yes, who was that? It was her son, you know. So now you've asked about five or six different questions, and once you get the answer, you can roll that fact that was just given into the next question so the jury keeps hearing it and hearing it and hearing it. So if, if the only thing that, that you hear today in this present, if that's the only thing you get out of the presentation is stop the conveyor belt, I think that is without a doubt 100% the most important thing that you can help that attorneys, attorney coaches, uh, and you can work with your attorney coaches on helping kids understand is with evidence. Um, cutting out unnecessary clutter. I, I think the other thing that lawyers have to help un kids understand is that there's two, different, there's two different audiences. The one audience is the judge. You turn to the judge, you're going to argue admissibility under a hearsay rule. You're going to use all the legal jargon. You're going to use terms of art. You're going to make every argument under the sun. Doesn't, you know, the jury doesn't have to understand what's going on. You're talking to the judge. But then when you turn to the jury, you don't want to sound like a lawyer. You don't want to use that legalese. You don't want to pretend like, you don't want to think, well, he must be really smart because he knows you know, 12 letter words. It doesn't work that way. Your job is to, and I sort of, I shouldn't say this, but I've sort of jokingly said in the past that your job is to convince 12 people who weren't smart enough to figure out how to get out of jury duty 
of your position, okay? It's just 12 lay people. You're talking to them, you're not talking to them like you talk to the judge. So cutting out unnecessary clutter, and, and for some reason, uh, kids think that, you know, they, they think that they have to do that. So you really gotta really get that out of their heads uh, and, and, and make them realize that trial advocacy is about talking to a layperson in a jury and making that point. Um, and I think, uh, I'm running out of time here, so I'm, I'm gonna just quickly go through some of these last slides. Um, you know, direct, when you're helping them develop direct, um, establishing the main theme, once you figure out what your overarching goal is in the case, once you figure out that you're gonna focus on one piece of evidence or two pieces of evidence, that will drive what you ask your witnesses. And um, sometimes, you know, you, you've got an, an opportunity to help kids do some unique things. Um, one year we had on, the, on the, the defense side of the case, um, there was a witness, this was, was a car accident, and the witness was a friend of the plaintiff. And he had some things that were in there favorable to the plaintiff. So we treated him, we treated this person as a hostile witness, and, and we had her say, oh, well, you know, say all the good stuff about the plaintiff. And then, and then we could say, well, you know, you swore to tell the truth, right? Yeah. Do you understand what the truth means? Because it was supposed to be a, a youngster, like, a, like an eight or nine year old. Yeah. Well, what is the truth? And we kind of had the witness sort of, sort of begrudgingly say, well, you know, my friend didn't look before she crossed the street. She just ran out to go, go after the ball, and that's why the car hit her. So, um, you know, establishing what your main goal is will drive your directs rather than just having them sort of be, you know, well, I'm gonna ask this question because that fact is contained in paragraph three of the affidavit. So um, I know I'm running out of time here. Um, I wanted to, to just pause briefly at the end and ask if there were any questions about um, some of the topics that we talked about today. Um, any questions? Thank you very much.